today, let's talk a little bit about the last couple bonds and what the district's doing now to accommodate growth. So what changed from the first bond in May of 22 to the November bond in 2022? We were very intentional about listening to our voters. Um, we did have a faction of voters who were opposing us, and so we, we called many of those in individually and in small groups, and we talked to them about what is it that caused you to oppose the bond. Uh, some of those voiced some, some issues and said, if you would tell us up front what it is that you're building. Let us see the actual design of the building because we don't want to vote on something that we don't know what we're actually getting. Uh, others said, we just want no tax rate increase. And then some said, well, we want no fluff. We really don't want anything dealing with athletics, anything like that. We want simply what you need. So we were very intentional in listening at that. And so we came back with the, the bond the second time uh, and we met those. We went ahead and did the preliminary designs. We had the pictures, we had the schematics of this is what the actual middle school will look like. It was no tax rate increase, and it was strictly a middle school with no extra fluff and nothing else in there. So with the bond um, not passing in May, the district did some, some things right away. What took place from May until the, you know, really the beginning of school? Uh, to accommodate our student overcrowding. We had to look at something, what are we going to do in the short term? Uh, because we were way over capacity and had to have a place to put those students. So uh, first step was we looked at portables and we purchased seven portables, three doubles that we purchased for the middle school, two doubles at Eastridge Elementary and two at Wooden Elementary. We also had to look at what are we going to do to, to provide more space at the uh, CTE building that is housed behind the middle school. So we rented some space from T. STC and we moved some of our classes over there as well. So those are a couple of the things we immediately did in order to try to alleviate some of that actual classroom overcrowding. Did not impact the overcrowding in the cafeterias, hallways, restrooms, uh, things like that, but it did at least alleviate some of the overcrowding in the actual classrooms. So we made some adjustments right away, called for a second bond, also didn't pass. What are we looking at now? Several different things that we have looked at. Um, we're literally exploring every option that is what we would consider possibly a doable option. Uh, I contacted um, DeSoto superintendent because they do have um, DeSoto East and talked to them about possibly leasing that so that we could make that a facility where we could bus some of our students to. It would still be Red Oak ISD, but it would be in a DeSoto ISD campus. We looked at possibly if we could move what is currently Little Hawks um, rent some space to move them and maybe turn that into a sixth grade center or possibly a, a pre-k kinder center. The problem with that is if you do that you're going to have to renovate it and that's going to require a bond as well. Plus it would be adding another route to our buses. It would be um, turning our elementaries then into a first through sixth grade and that caused some parental concern about sixth graders being on campus with first graders. Uh, we looked at what if we reduced the bond um, on Westmoreland and just built a sixth grade center. Again, um, that would be a Band-Aid. You mentioned Little Hawks, so I do want to ask. Yes. Little Hawks is a valuable program for the school district, something that's replicated in other districts. Is that something the district's looking at getting rid of, or is that something that we see as a value? Definitely see that as a value for our staff. Um, many, many districts, as you said, offer that um, on-site daycare for their employees, and it is a perk. And uh, when you are trying to be competitive, um, you definitely want to offer all those benefits that you can. We have people that say, well, it's only a benefit for a few. Every benefit we have is just for those who choose to use it. Same with insurance. That's a big benefit for employees, but many employees, they're on their spouse's insurance and they don't take that benefit. But Little Hawks definitely is uh, something that we see as a big benefit to retain our teachers. There's a misinformation out there about the cost of Little Hawks and, yes. and the benefit. Talk a little bit about that. Uh, some people think that, that saying it's a benefit, that means the district actually foots the bill for all of that, and that is not true. Uh, the parents actually pay a rate, and we try to be a competitive rate on that as well. Uh, they actually pay a supply fee so that they're actually covering the cost the parents are of the supplies. The parents actually bring the food as well, snacks as well. So there's a lot of things that the parents are actually footing the bill on that we don't publicize out there, but that is a known thing here in the district. And again, we try to keep those rates very competitive. We look at those. Uh, we're looking at them again this year to see are we comparable to other districts as well, and not just districts, other daycares as well. So it is a benefit, yes, for those parents to be able to bring their child with them to the district. They're on the same calendar that way. They know that um, they have great care and that great instruction, but the parents are paying for that. 
What is the projected growth looking like for the next five to six years? About 300 students, um, middle school, 50 to 60 students just at the middle school. We're looking at probably by 2027 around 7,100 students. So the growth is steady. Of course, we're going to have those moments when we become stagnant and when we decline a little. But overall, the growth looks to be a project about 7,100 by 2026. I don't think it takes much to just drive around and look at the rooftops. Um, we see housing developments going in. We hear from the city of Red Oak about the number of housing. Last year was 2,200 new single family homes alone, not counting the apartment spaces yes. available. We know Glen Heights is continuing to see growth. All that does lead to the fact that we do have to house every student that comes you know, to Red Oak ISD. So Correct. if we can get a second middle school, how does that benefit us? Yes, I love what you said because it's true. We have many people that say, well, just quit taking the kids. Well, you can't just quit taking the kids. If they live in our uh, school district, then we are required to accept those students and we want to accept those students. Mm -hmm. They're our students and we want to educate them. So that growth is out there. Anyone can drive around. I, I did so this past weekend and I was just just amazed at the rooftop still going up. I know with the market and the interest, people are saying, well, it is slowing down. It's slowing down, but it's not stopping. We definitely have that continual growth that is going. Uh, a second middle school on the other side um, of the interstate would be, it'd be easily accessible. It would definitely service Glen Heights, Ovilla, and probably some of our Red Oak students as well. It allows an opportunity for two basketball teams, two band programs, two fine arts areas. It just allows for those kids to shine more because right now when you have 1,600 in one place, you may have some kids that are knocked off those teams who are not in their top, what they would consider 10%, who are not the ones that are on their student council. But if you split them in half, you are literally servicing two groups of students. And we're able to really, really meet those needs. And that's important for kids. They have to have something to be involved in, especially at the middle school when they're trying to find their way. You mentioned a lot about the that, that you know having the two elements. How does that um, help a student mature socially, emotionally, finding their niche, building relationships with staff if they're not engaged versus if they are engaged? Uh, that is a huge factor, like I said, especially at the middle school when they're finding their way, but it's, it's in all grade levels. Anytime you can have a student who's involved, if it's an activity, if it's a group, if it's an organization, athletics, fine arts, after school organizations, just finding their way that really, really helps them to just become a part. And when they're a part of something, a part of like a family, uh, you know, just anything to be a part of, it helps in the area of discipline. Um, they're not likely to get in trouble because they are spending their time doing something productive. It's letting them be part of Red Oak ISD. They literally are, are just ingraining themselves in our district. So it's very important emotionally, it's very Im important socially uh, and academically because I'm telling you right now, those kids that are involved, they strive to have those higher academics as well. So all around, we would be serving double the amount of students in those capacities with the second middle school. Sounds like a lot of benefits, not just um, space-wise. Yes. But really for the, the development of students, as you mentioned, socially, there's lower discipline, there's better academics. Yes. Students have a healthier feel to being in a better school when, when they're not in a huge campus. That's Absolutely. not really fit for that number of students. Absolutely. We've had some folks say that we, we're allowing anybody in and we let anybody come and enroll here. So how are we addressing that? And, and we did have a previous enrollment allowed. Yes. Um, and where are we with that status? We are not an open enrollment district. Um, so basically you have to meet the qualifications in order to uh, establish residency here in Red Oak ISD. We do have a department and we, um, we check those. Our PEMS department, they're very good about making sure all of the information is in order on the campus level. It comes to the district level. If someone is reported, you know, they don't live in the district, then we have a, um, a person as well that goes out and, and checks that residency. Uh, yes, you mentioned the fact that we at one point were open enrollment, so we do have uh, some students, around 30 students that are still grandfathered in on that, but the vast majority of our students are our students. Um, and there are different ways to qualify, so you can go on our website and see that, but we are not open enrollment. We don't just have a vacancy sign. They have to be our students or qualify in order to be served here at Red Oak ISD. So you said we are looking at investigating. What, what does that entail and what can be the outcomes of those investigations? Many times uh, if we receive a call, an email, someone says, uh, you know, this person uh, lives in um, 
Waxahachie. They don't live in Red Oak ISD. Then we actually have someone who uh, verifies, first of all, the paperwork to see if that paperwork is in order. And then they actually make home visits to see if uh, the person is residing there, if they're actually laying their head down there. Uh, there are clauses, grandparent clause, um, power of attorney. There's all kinds of different things that it could be. But in the event that it is someone who has falsified, we also uh, are looking at filing those charges through the court system because we do not want people falsifying documents to come to our district. We want to make sure we are truly serving our students here at Red Oak ISD. And those students will be removed? Yes, those students would be removed if they are shown to not reside in Red Oak ISD or fall under one of the categories. Well, thank you for answering our questions today about the growth and, and how we're addressing some of those uh, situations here in Red Oak ISD. Okay, thank you.